Michael, um, it's fabulous being here, um, talking to the MBA Association of Ireland. It's wonderful. And I think that's what the pandemic's done is, it's really brought us globalization, um, which we didn't have before, and not to the same extent that we've had to, that we have today. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm just going to share my screen um, and so that I could take you through a PowerPoint slide, uh, not, not death by PowerPoint, but just some, some, some reminders. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, this governance of organizations, really, that's what this new standard is all about. And I'll tell you a little bit about, about the standard. Um, it was published in September last year um, in the middle of the pandemic, um, towards the end, I suppose. So it, it hasn't received the um, flag waving that we've seen from other, other standards like the ISO um, 9001 Management System Standard and, for example, the ISO 27000 series, which is information security. So we haven't seen the same kind of um, energy around it, and I think it's just because we are sitting uh, with a lot on our hands at the moment as leaders of organizations. But if I can just start, you know, why do you need to know about this standard? First of all, there's international consensus. So unlike, as you say, that we have in uh, you, between Ukraine and Russia at the moment, uh, we had international consensus on what is good governance. Uh, what constitutes good governance. And that included the Russian delegation. Um, it included 77 countries agreeing on what good governance looks like. So we've got a true international parity. Um, we've got many um, you know, uh, national approaches to the governance of an organization, corporate governance, you might call it, in when it comes to corporates. Um, but really, why do... Um, people who have done MBAs, why do you need to know? It's increased career mobility. That's the real benefit. Um, it allows you to understand governance in across multi-jurisdictions, and it allows you to govern in an organization that's multinational. Um, in today's world, post-pandemic, we are all um, multinational. Uh, we all operate uh, with suppliers in various countries and with um, clients in other countries. Uh, you know, as I am doing today. So this is really important for everyone. Um, so it's an ISO standard. ISO is, um, was established post World War II. Let's hope we don't have another one of those. Um, and it's um, governed under the United Nations Economic and Social Council. The, that's quite important because the primary purpose of international standards is to facilitate international trade so that one country, organizations in one country can understand how things are done in another country or can at least understand against a standard that they should be done in the same way. Um, so it's really around this trade and trust in, um, in organizations and in their various processes and their abilities. How we participate in ISO is as national standards body. So you've got a, a National Standards Institute of, of Ireland. We've got the South African Bureau of Standards in South Africa. We've got the British, uh, the BSI, British Standards Institute. So um, every, every uh, country is represented on, on this, in the ISO platform on these various projects. Um, we started off by doing an environmental scan, and I headed that up, and we looked at every code and regulation and standard across the world. Um, we had we looked at academic materials, we looked at publications, and those are the countries that you see there that are the 77 countries that participated in this. Um, large big black hole in Africa, and you'll see it's quite um, a developing country issue. Um, and that's really because of the participation by those national committees and the effort and resources required to participate in the ISO standards. We did get the main influences in Africa, obviously South Africa, um, we had Nigeria and we had Kenya. Also very influential was Ghana, which is a growing, um, growing powerhouse in Africa. We also had 83 liaison organizations participating. These are organizations like the Organization for Economic and Cooperative Development, the OECD. We had uh, the Global Network of Directors Institutes. We had um, the International Federation of Accountants, IFAC. 
Uh, we had the International Internal Audit Association. So we had really 83 of these large global bodies participating and providing the input. Perhaps quite importantly um, is that we didn't only have regulators involved as experts in developing the standard. We also had consumer bodies. We had, as you heard, the assurance providers. We had um, the labor organizations, and we also had the investment, uh, the investors. So this is a standard for all types of organizations, um, no matter where you're incorporated and no matter your size and no matter how you're incorporated. It really is a generic standard for the governance of all sizes, types, and locations of organizations. And as I said, we achieved international consensus on what constitutes good governance, and we had 100% approval on that. And there are not many ISO codes and standards that can can have a claim to that fame. There's 100% approval of all the countries involved. It was published last year. Um, quite differently from other approaches to governance is it's principled-based with identified outcomes. So it's not a compliance, um, it's not a certifiable standard. We have to call it a standard because that's how uh, ISO works. We can't call it a code or a report because ISO doesn't have those things. Uh, so we have to call it a standard, but it's not a management system standard. It's not like the 9001 and the 27000 at how to make a light bulb. It, it is a principled-based standard. There's no how-to in here. It's guidance in terms of the what, and then it does give key aspects of the how-to, but it's not certifiable. And this, the, just a reminder in terms of its purpose, why did we come together with this international agreement? It's because we want an understanding internationally that across borders, we understand what good governance looks like. So we, we really only, we don't hear about good governance in the press, we only hear about bad governance. So the question was out there, so if this is bad governance, and obviously we can see bad governance in Enron, VW, we can just name all of those organizations that are poorly governed, but what does it mean to be well governed? And that's what we've done here with the standard. How does it work with national codes and national standards? Um, this really acts as a conceptual framework. So the national regulations, the in-country regulations, the in-country codes all still apply. In fact, they're more appropriately for, they're more appropriate for that country than this ISO standard. However, if you are operating internationally, this standard does apply. So if you're looking from one country to the next, what constitutes good governance? It's not your in-country code. It's not your regulations. It's ISO 37000. So we have international law and we also have an international standard for good governance. I think we're going to have some questions on that later, Michael. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, and pop them in the in the Q&A if you want. We're going to pick them up afterwards. So what does the standard actually look like? What has it got in it? First of all, as an ISO standard, you have to buy it. So it comes at a fee. Um, if you buy it from ISO, it tends to be more, it tends to be cheaper, although you're, you can also buy it from your national body. Your national standards body might have a, a special discount depending on what region you're in and what discounts you can get from ISO. So most of it is for, it, it, most of the, the terminology is free, the introduction is free, and the, the model that I'll show you later is, is freely available. What I'm showing you now is what's in the purchased, uh, the closed portion of the standard. And essentially, there's uh, three main objectives to the standard. The one is establishing the conditions for good governance. Clause four, is all about establishing these conditions. The conditions are, first of all, that governance, although it happens at the governing body level, at the board level, it is integrated and it needs to be integrated throughout the organization. So it's not, it's the responsibility of the governing body, but it is also um, the res results of the consequences of that governance need to be permeated, permeated throughout the organization. So how do we do that? We do that through effective delegation 
And in delegation, it, it talks about what is effective delegation. So essentially delegation without abdication. So you can't delegate your accountability, but you want to delegate responsibilities. I mean, the board can't do everything. That's why you have executives and you have employees because the board can't do it all. So the board must delegate its authority. And when it delegates its authority, it needs to do that together with responsibilities. And those responsibilities, the authority needs to be commensurate with the responsibilities. So you need to have enough authority to do what you have to do, what you're being, what the responsibilities that you've been given. So um, another aspect of delegation that's spoken about is that that of accounting for your delegated authority and responsibilities. And that is reporting back. So the governing body or the board delegating responsibilities and authority and then likewise receiving and overseeing the reports and monitoring the reports that are coming back from that delegated authority and responsibilities. So those are the, that's the essence of effective delegation is not abdication. It's putting your hands around what you have, the authority that you have given to people and overseeing, having demonstrating accountability by overseeing and reporting. Then importantly, there's a difference between governance and management. And we often don't get that right, especially when we have a unitary board structure. So there are um, frameworks, legislative frameworks across the world where we have dual boards. In Europe, it's common, where we have a supervisory board that comprises non-executive directors, and we have a management board comprising of essentially executive directors. So it is important when we in a unitary board, we've got both together and we're discussing it together and we're discussing um, matters from a non-executive perspective, as in those people who don't have a detailed understanding of the day-to-day -day activities of the organization, as well as an executive where you do have that detailed understanding. Another difference is that as an executive, you are also managing staff, you are managing people so there could be confusion and there are cases of confusion that have gone to the courts where, um, where a directive is given from a manage, an executive director to a staff member. And there's been a misunderstanding as to whether that directive was as part of the governing body. So it's a governance directive on behalf of the board or is it a management directive as my immediate superior? So getting that difference between management and when you're managing and when you're governing, getting that right is, is very important. And of course, there are links between the two. The third aspect is that of sustainability. And sustainability, there we talk about, of course, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We talk about double materiality. So if I could just stop on double materiality, it's something that comes through very clearly in this standard, and it's something that we needed to make sure was in the standard. And it is the approach that is taken in the EU, um, unlike the approach that's taken by the IFRS Foundation. So a little bit about that. Um, what do we mean by double materiality? So if you think about the ESG and, and the G at the top of the triangle, so G is the organization, the governance of the organization, and we're governing in an environment, um, a natural and economic environment, and we're governing in an environment with stakeholders. So the E, the E and the E, and S. So the economic, natural environment and society. So we are governing in that kind of the, the ESG environment. Now, initially, when sustainable development was um, published with the Brooklyn Commission in 1987, uh, a while ago, um, they spoke about um, making sure the sustainable development was essentially being able to um, ensure that you have um, the ability of future generations to, to continue to live as you have um, in a nutshell. So they were largely considering the impact of the organization, the G, on the E and the E and the S. So that's the one way, is, is the material impact that the organization has on the environment, economy, and society. As we fast forward now into the 21st century, there's also been increasing impact that we've seen of the, um, of the natural environment and society. You mentioned Ukraine. We think about the climate crisis. So increasing impact 
on the financial resources of the organization itself and other resources. So if we think about the organization down, we've equally got the environment up to the organization. Now, the IFRS Foundation are focusing on um, sustainability financial disclosures, which is really about the impact of the environment, economy, and society on the organization, as opposed to the organization's impact on those. When we talk about double materiality, we're talking about both. We're talking about the impact of the organization on the E and the S, and we're talking about the E and the S's impact on the organization. It's that double materiality. So the EU is following a double materiality reporting directive, and that's the, and you might hear the terms TCFD, FRAG is, is the organization behind that. Um, but essentially this standard, when it talks about sustainability, it's talking about both aspects, the organization's impact on the environment, economy, and society, and the uh, environment, economy, and society's impact on the organization. So conditions for good governance, making sure that you delegate throughout the organization, make sure that you're differentiating between when you're managing and when you're governing, and it equally throughout the organization. And when you are considering sustainability and sustainable development, that you're thinking on both sides, on both aspects. Finally, um, the final condition for integrated governance is considering stakeholders. Now, I'm sure as MBA students, you've uh, in your past, you've thought about um, you know, the, the supremacy or the primacy of the shareholder and Milton Friedman, and we've moved on to that. And the World Economic Forum calls it stakeholder capitalism. Well, we've moved on from stakeholder capitalism as well, um, because it's not just the financial resources where stakeholders need to be considered. It's stakeholder inclusivity. So in all, as the Integrated Reporting, uh, International Integrated Reporting Council, which became the VRA, which became IFRS, long story, <laughs> but what the Integrated Reporting Framework calls um, inclusivity, stakeholder inclusivity. So in all your decision-making, um, you need to have identified material or relevant stakeholders and considered their needs, wants, and expectations in your decision making. So that is, the first three are really about throughout the organization, and certainly considering stakeholders is throughout the organization, but it's more of a, um, that's looking outwards as well, um, from a, the stakeholder uh, influence into the organization. So integrated governance, and I, I stopped on that for quite a long, long time, because that's a fundamental condition for applying the principles in the standard. The second aspect of uh, good, uh, the conditions for good governance is about the governing body itself, right? Um, it doesn't matter what codes and practices and things you have. Um, it doesn't matter how many boxes you've ticked and ethics policies and this, that, and the other thing. If you've got a governing body that's allowing fraud or corruption to happen throughout the organization, or you've got a governing body a member themselves, a director who's misbehaving, it doesn't really help, right? <laughs> so in the governing body itself, we need to have the um, right competence to be able to oversee what's happening in the organization. If you are an IT organization, a, a technology, if you are involved in cryptocurrency, you certainly don't want to have a board that doesn't understand those things. So we need to have a board that is competent, especially in what matters to that organization. And today's technology matters to every organization. So don't have a board that cannot um, pick up a cell phone, that cannot, that hasn't worked in Instagram or Facebook or doesn't understand those technologies. It really is not helpful. So understanding that we have, have to have competent board members. And then I'd like to go back to the composition and structure because on the basis of competence, it doesn't mean that that competence lives only in the board. That governing body could create structures like committees. And we do that for accounting, right? We've got an audit committee. And the audit committee oversees specifically financial matters and assurance. And those are specific competencies and technical expertise that doesn't always live in the board itself. And plus it gives, the audit committee gives it as, um, an independent view. 
So you've got a board that's using these structures. Likewise, on technology, not all the board members need to be coders in their past. You could use a structure, a committee that looks specifically on technology, the use of, of data, artificial intelligence, um, you know, we think about Cambridge Analytica, et cetera, we can use structures that oversee those matters, as opposed to every member of the governing body having those that competence. And then moving backwards again, the composition of the board itself. Here we talk about, uh, you know, we've got a lot of um, boards um, and um, advisors talking about the 30%. 30% is a critical mass, so looking at 30% gender diversity, 30% um, um, labor involvement. So everybody wants to have a seat on the board, misunderstanding that the board is there to act on behalf of the company. So the, the board needs to act in the best interests of that organization. So that's what we need to get right. It's not so much about um, do we have labor represented? Do we have a shareholder represented? Representation only brings information into the boardroom, into the decision-making process. That's what the representation does. The actual decision-making itself needs to be done not on behalf of those representations, but on behalf of the organization in the best interest of the organization. So the composition of that board is really about making sure that the debate is rigorous and considers all of this information and perspectives. So as you were saying, Michael, you know, the Ukrainian president and the Russian president, they both have, they both absolutely believe that they're doing the right thing. We look at it from the side, we have no idea. We don't like the results of it, but they believe that they're doing the right thing for their country. They're acting in the best interests of their country. And that's as a president, that's what you should be doing. Likewise, when it comes to a board, you're acting in the best interest of your organization. So having a, co a composition of like-minded people is going to get groupthink. We, we need to have a diversity of thinkers to challenge, to challenge those who are the bullies in the room or who are effective and assertive in the room who perhaps have a perspective, a lens, that they're not able to look at other lenses. So I go back to ISO. ISO is a, a consensus-driven process. And here we're looking at almost building up a consensus amongst the board. So voting and you get 50% vote or 50, 50 plus 1% 1 vote, that's not a good vote. That's not a good result because half of your board, just less than half of your board, doesn't agree with the decision in their own minds, right? So what you're trying to do at a board is you're trying to build consensus, but you're building consensus through diverse thinking. So I focused a lot on that composition because it's not about ticking the box and saying you've got 30% of your board is female, 30% of them are, are, are um, appropriately uh, racially profiled um, or represent cultures. It's, it's not about that. This is about getting effective decision-making, making sure that we don't have that radical president that acts on their own behalf and bullies the rest of the, of the, the government structures. Um, that's really what that's about. So clause four, before you even start with the rest of the standard, make sure you've got the right conditions. If you don't have the right conditions, don't read any further, <laughs> focus on those. But reading further, this, diagram or this model and bragging rights here this is my model <laughs> it's been hammered about um, it was a rough diamond it's been hammered about through international consensus but it's looking good um, this model really just sets out the principles remember i said it's a, a principled based standard um, it's not practices this is about applying your mind and applying various principles so internationally, we have agreed that the very center of governance is the organization's purpose. And we call this the foundational, sorry, the primary. This is the primary governance principle. As a primary governance principle, it, it's the only one where we have it together with both sides of the coin. There's the purpose and that that's the what, and there's the how, which is the values. 
So we talk about the organizational values. So how are you behaving when you go about doing that what? Because as I said, we can't have poorly behaving directors or poorly behaving executives um, in an organization. So we need to establish the behavior right in the center, right up front. So when we establish the purpose for the organization, we also establish and how is that organization going to achieve it? And we had organizations like arms manufacturers in the room um, debating this. So the purpose, of, uh, the, the purpose of the organization is to manufacture arms, right? That was one of the, uh, a couple of organizations in the debate at, T, at, at the ISO level. So if your purpose is to manufacture arms, what is ethical? How do you establish your organizational values around that? And what's the difference between morals and ethics? So very importantly, fundamental to the governance of the organization is understanding the organization's purpose and the values that go with that. Secondarily are the foundational governance principles. So these are about the doing and we need to generate value. So we need to set value generation objectives as a board. And then we need to co-create a strategy with the organization uh, with the executives to understand, so how are we going to generate this value, which is a result of our purpose. Then strategy gets interpreted into business plans and the executives go away and create business plans and controls around that and understands, you know, it goes away and does this business plan. And throughout the process, four times a year on average, the board oversees that the strategy has been implemented as we agreed, and that it's according to the parameters that the governing body put parameters around it, that the governing body is overseeing. The parameters are, are contained in, a, in governance policies. And again, governance policies are owned by the board, and they're the, they're the policies that the board should be adopting. And those, again, need to be principled-based. They're saying the what, again, not the how. The board appoints the, the best, supposedly, for the organization to determine the how. So, yes, the board will oversee the how, but really the organization needs to come back to the board and tell them the how. So, um, I talk about my teenage son going out underage, you know, to parties, <laughs> and I, you know, send him out there and I say, okay, these are, these are the what's. I'm going to be dropping you off. I'm going to be talking to the parents. I'm going to be picking you up you're not going to be drinking and you're not going to be going to be smoking. So those are the what's right. Um, I don't like that. Um, but short of standing next to the next to him at the party, I'm, I can't control him. He needs to determine how he's going to enjoy himself at the party within those parameters. After the party, when I pick him up, I'm going to ask the questions as any good mother should. Um, how did it go? Was it fun? You know, what's your opinion of things? But what are the facts? You know, I want to smell you. I want to smell your breath. I want to smell your clothes. <laughs> I don't know whether you've kept within my parameters or not. So that's the oversight. I can't control you. Board can't control the organization, but certainly the board can oversee that the controls that you put in place were applied. And then finally, to account, account for your parenthood, account for being the board, and you account through disclosure. You account through transparency to your stakeholders and you, you gain assurance um, on your accountabilities to make sure that what you, what you are disclosing is right. Because if we're disclosing poor data, think of this greenwashing, it has a huge reputational impact on the organization. How can you trust an organization when, when your sustainability report has just been blown out the water? So we need to understand our accountability and assure ourselves of that accountability. So these are our activities, right? This is what we're doing. And while we're doing that, and so we've had this for, for many, many years, right? This, that, you know, set your policy and your strategy and oversee and demonstrate accountability. Cadbury spoke about it way back in 1992. So we've had these things for a long time. Bob Tricker, Bob Garrett, John Carver, I can just name, and of course, Mervyn King all of these guys, the governance experts. But what's different in the 21st century? What is different is that we need to take a lot more into account when we're doing these things. It's not just good enough to govern. We need to engage stakeholders. 
We need to have ethical and effective leadership. We need to understand that data is required to go into decision making. And not only is data a, a, an important asset for our decision making, but it's also an important asset for our competitors and for bad actors. So understanding that we're protecting that data too. Understanding that we need to govern risk and govern risk, not only um, risk management in the organization, but also that as a board, we practice good risk management ourselves. So when we make a decision, we actually know what the risk implications are, the threats and opportunities of making that decision are. So we're practicing good risk management ourselves. And then the two sustainability factors. And yes, we had a long debate, should it be one, should it be two? I wanted one, then we'd have 10 principles, but no, we had to have two, so we got 11 principles now. 10 would have been really nice because I can count them on my two little handies. So we've got 11 now, have to use a toe too. So we've got social responsibility and we've got viability and performance over time. The double materiality in this principle and the social responsibility. These are called enabling governance principles. And these are foundational and this is our primary. And it's all for the achievement of this outside. And the outside is how do you know whether an organization's governing body is applying these, uh, are applying, uh, the body is applying these principles. Well, you look to the organization. You, you don't know enough about the governing body. You look to the organization. And the organization can demonstrate three outcomes when it's being well governed. It is performing well. It's achieving its targets. It promised dividends. It's giving dividends. If it's not giving dividends, it tells you why it's not giving dividends. It's giving um, uh, you know, value to the clients, um, value to the employees. So it's performing well. Second of all, when it performs well, it's also behaving well. So it's got ethical behavior. It's, um, you don't have bad um, governors. You know, your, your directors aren't behaving poorly. Your executives aren't behaving poorly. Uh, the organization in society, we call it corporate citizenship, the organization as a whole is behaving well. So that's ethical behavior. And then finally, that it is, it is stewarding its own resources well and beyond financial resources only. So uh, human resources, environmental resources, et cetera, its own resources well, as well as understanding its impact on the world's resources. So that's responsible stewardship. And those are the three things that we look at to see whether an organization has been well governed. I just want to stop quickly on this value creation because it's new. And those of you who follow the IFAC papers, the International uh, Finance, uh, what International Federation of Accountants, they put out a paper and they were very involved in crafting this principle on value generation, as was the IIA, the in, uh, Institute of Internal Auditors. Um, it's the only, because this is quite new, value creation, and we talk about enterprise value creation, and there's creation, preservation, erosion, you know, in ISO, we just got so many terms, we wanted to come up with a neat term, so we called it generation. So we call it value generation. And it's the only principle where we get a little bit prescriptive around what this means, because there's not a lot of guidance around there, out there on this. And we said the board's role in value generation is to first of all define a value generation model for the organization. So what are your objectives for your various stakeholders? You've identified your stakeholders. So what are your objectives with as pertains the clients, as pertains your employees, as pertains your shareholders, as pertains your creditors, as pertains the regulators, as pertains the society? What are your value generation objectives. And this doesn't mean only financial value. This is what value are you adding in its broadest sense. Then make sure that you've got the right strategy and business model and resourcing to go and create that value, oversee this creation. And then while you've got the right plans to do this, create the value, and then you oversee that it, this value is being delivered, create, this is being generated, and then very importantly, this last step, when you deliver that value, when you pay your dividends, when you pay your regulator fines because you decided not to be, that was approach as opposed to mitigating the risk, um, make sure that when you do hand out this value, 
that the organization itself retains value so that it, it is sustainable. And those are the four aspects um, that the standard goes into on this value generation. And then just finally, just looping back to say, why is this so important for us? And there hasn't been a lot of rah-rah around it yet. And I think it's because we've got too much else on our plates. But this is so incredibly important for every organization and for every individual that's involved in an organization. First of all, because you get global recognition. Um, and there is a training program involved, um, available. Um, I'm, I actually present it. Um, and that is, there's recommended courses on the Good Governance Academy, Good Academy's website, um, where you can find access to that. So you can get globally recognized. Now, we can't certify the organization, but we can certainly certify the individual as, being, as having an understanding of this, of this standard. So the individual can be certified and that certification is globally recognized. One, when you are certified and you have this global recognition, there's international parity. So you understand that somebody else in Jamaica has the same certification as you do. You know that they're using the same language because that's a very important outcome from this work is that we have a dictionary. We have the same terminology across the world. When we, see, when we say governing body, we all know what we mean by governing body. When we say policy, governance policy, we all know what we mean by governance policy. And that international parity is certified. We can understand that when we're speaking to somebody in Indonesia, China, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, California, everybody has got the same understanding of what we're talking about. Individuals, career mobility, you can work on any board in any jurisdiction if you understand ISO 37000. Of course, you're going to have to learn, being a competent board member, the local legislation, the local regulations, etc. You need to be nationally aware, but you've got this international accreditation. And then, of course, if you're working in an organization that is a multinational, you'll have a more detailed understanding of what those other countries are needing from you. And you don't just go in like a big brother or a big bully and say, um, okay, I'm gonna use the, the Sarbanes-Oxley in the US. And they say, because we have Sarbanes-Oxley and, and you're a subsidiary of ours, you need to have uh, an, uh, an ethics policy. Um, here you have a far more detailed understanding of what the companies and the organizations around the world need in terms of good governance. So that's the bottom line, Michael. I think um, that's me. That's an overview. And we have got some questions. Thanks, Melia, Carolyn. That's brilliant. Um, just saw a couple coming in, I think, from Connor. Um, bear with me one sec. Uh, is the standard voluntary and why do it? Yes, it is voluntary. Why do it? Because um, other organizations are going to look at you and want to ask you what your um, what good governance looks like. They're going to look to you, understanding that there's a standard for good governance, and are you applying that standard? It's beyond compliance. So I, I talk about um, oh, my poor son, Shane. Um, when I send him to school, I don't send him to school and say, go to school and just pass your exams. Now, sometimes I do, but just pass your exams. No, I send him to school and I say, go and do your best and sometimes just pass your exam, but go and do your best. And that's what society wants. We cre Society created the construct of an organization, the construct of a company. We have organizations because we created them. We don't want them to just go and pass their exams. We want them to go and do their best. And when organizations start doing their best and you have an organization that's standing next to you doing its best and you're not doing your best, you're just complying, then there are going to be questions asked. So yes, it's voluntary. And yes, you can just pass your exams, but people are going to look at you and wonder why you aren't trying your best. Yeah, striving to be to be better. And, you know, I think that's all of us. And even why we're all here, we're trying to learn and improve ourselves. And that's, that's exactly what companies should be doing. Um, just a question that 
Corporate governance in Ireland is largely compliance based. Um, how would the standard be applied in this context? Compliance obviously takes precedent. So yes, um, you have uh, legislation um, and you also have various uh, codes for the various sectors, um, only certain sectors. Again, some of those codes are voluntary as well. But what ISO 37000 does is it provides you with an overarching what internationally is agreed as being this is, this is what good governance looks like. It's principles, it's not practices, and compliance tends to be practices. You need to have 30% female or whatever you know, the, the compliance practices are. The, the, the ISO 37000 doesn't tell you to do those specific things. It, it gives you guidance in terms of what does good governance look like and what are the outcomes that you can expect from that. So it is, can I say beyond compliance or not merely, not merely compliance, but compliance is inherent. You have to comply first. You have to pass your exams. Then you can do your best. Okay. I'm sorry, there's just another one from Connor. Um, which areas were the most difficult to get a consensus on and any shortcomings in the standard as a result? Mm. Yes. Um, mm. um, so one is we don't use the word control at all. That was a very difficult one um, because... When some, you say control, is, is that mm. control measures? that boards can put in place? So the use of the word, so words are really important, the use of the word control, because there was a big argument. Um, in fact, it's a country that's very close to you on your west. Um, there's a big argument that um, we don't want to do this co command and control anymore. There's this, we, this aspect of command and control is, is no longer relevant in organizations today. It's not this hierarchical, autocratic environment. We want um, to be socially aware. Um, so that's why we had to withdraw the term control. And now if you think about the Cadbury report and various codes across the, across the world, even the South African King 4 code is uses the term control. And that's control is misinterpreted, um, not only if you just use the word, but also if you translate it. So the word control, uh, yes, we talk about internal controls. And so we'll always refer to controls, but not control. So I think that was one of the difficult ones. Another one is um, environment. So is it the economic environment? Is it the social environment? We can't use the word environment. So wherever you see environment, it's a two-part word. It's natural environment. So yes, the standard is clumsy because we had to get the terminology right. Um, where is the standard lacking? Um, for me, I think um, there's been a compromise around um, oversight of change um, and making sure that the changes across the organization are being well governed. For me, there's such a thing as death by a thousand cuts. So if you have your employees um, wanting to make changes to your technology, changes to your process, all of those little changes can, can knock you off your strategic direction. Taken collectively, they can knock you off. Um, just a click policy, you are taking a new um, software, it's going to save you lots of time, um, but it's got AI built into it, it's got machine learning, it's using data that you shouldn't be using. Um, that can also, it's a click policy, some employee just clicked it and now the organization is committed. Use another example, um, ransomware. So there's no policy that talks about ransomware and the paying of Bitcoin, for example, or paying of a cryptocurrency. So the organization didn't want to get involved in cryptocurrency. You paid the Bitcoin. You suddenly now have ownership in a cryptocurrency. So, yeah, it's, it's the, the governance of change, I think, is going to come through more clearly in revisions. Well, I hope it will. Um, but it wasn't um, an imperative that was brought through um, internationally. Um, finally, then, um, how many or how do organizations uh, measure themselves against the standard? Mm. So I gave you a little hint of around those three governance outcomes, but 
of course it needs more than that. How are you going to report on your governance? So 37,000 was uh, many years in the making. We started in 2016. Um, uh, we really you know, started getting words on paper in 2017. So there isn't, um, there isn't currently a standard that measures it. Um, but there's two projects on the go. One is the creation and the development of indicators for good governance. Um, so that is, first of all, so it developed into two standards. <laughs> the one is what is an indicator and how do you develop indicators? And the other one is what is an indicator for good governance? So, so that we've got two standards that are under development at the moment. They're still working drafts, which means that they're very messy um, and they haven't even gone outside of into the countries themselves for commenting. It's still amongst the experts. Then we have another project um, that I'm um, a co-convener on that project, and that's a governance maturity model, which looks at levels of maturity. And it also looks at um, more than just your practices of governance. It says, do you have the right behavior? Does the board, is the board's attitude towards governance the right attitude, an appropriate attitude? Um, are you applying the principles using practices that are appropriate for your organization? So if you've got um, a great big thick 50 page a corporate governance framework and you're a thousand person organization, oh, that's not really appropriate. You're misspending your resources. Uh, for 100,000 people, of course, you need something that's far more rigorous. So what are your practices um, for your applying the principles? And then finally, how efficient are you? So that um, formalization, do you, so Sarbanes Oxy talks about you need to have a document because you need a document because the auditors need to go and check that you've got a document. You know, um, are you telling your staff about the document? Yes, you are. I need to check that as well. Well, that's not good governance. You know, that's compliance. So how do you make sure that this is coming through? Um, you behave well, you use the right practices that are appropriate, but in the case of a document, you have a document, you have a level of formalization when there's lots of people you need to communicate with and you've got this broken telephone, right? So the message is getting misinterpreted the broader you get. So in an owner-managed organization and you've got your arms around the organization, you've got 10 employees, you know, how much do you really need to document uh, when it comes to governance? When you've got 100 people or you've got different investors now, now you just need to start saying, this is our approach too, and here it is. And you review it because it might change. So there's three real aspects that we look, look to in the maturity model. It's the attitude towards governance, whether you're trying your best or you're just complying. Um, we look at um, how you're applying those principles, whether you're using uh, good practice, because there are some key aspects of practice that 37,000 does provide. Um, and we, we evaluate it against that. Um, and then we assess it against that. And then, of course, um, your formalization. But over those three, we look at the appropriateness for the organization. So a level five, which is the highest level, we go from zero to five. A level five um, is not appropriate for many organizations. Um, we Maybe it's even a misspend, a misspend of your resources. So the board needs to decide what level of maturity is most appropriate for the organization. And it might be a level three. You might be sitting on a level one and you need to get to a level three but of course, we need to prioritize across because everything we need, every change we make, make needs resources and time and effort. So to improve governance practices, we need to make sure that it's appropriate for the organization. So long answer. Yes, we are putting out um, uh, standards on the ability to measure governance. One is the indicators. And as I said, that's still quite messy. The other one is the maturity model. The maturity model has just been released as a committee draft. And that means it's gone to all the countries and all the liaison bodies for commenting. So it's good enough to send out for, for international comments. And, but this is our first round of international commenting. Then we need to go into a draft standard. So this is pre-draft. And then we go into a final draft and then we go in for publication. That we're expecting to be published early, early next year, mid next year. 
So nothing at the moment is a short answer. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Uh, yes. I think we leave it there. Uh, Carolyn, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, the 